We're going to look at problems from the unit quiz number one from the online AP source. And first of all, we're going to look at this theorem. And this is not a biconditional. We're saying that if you have a limit that actually exists and the limit of g of x as x approaches a is equal to b, so we get this value, then if you're taking the limit of a function composition, you can find the limit of the inner function and take f of that value to get your value of the limit. In other words, the limit of f of g of x as x approaches a is f of that inner limit. And that's going to be true if f is continuous at b at that inner value. So then this is one of the problems from the unit 1 quiz. We're finding the limit as x approaches negative 1 of f of f of x. So as x approaches negative 1 of f of x, that limit is equal to 2. You have this value down here, which doesn't really matter to us because the limit is approaching 2. So then we're going to look at f of 2. Well, the limit as x approaches 2 from the right and from the left is different. It's not continuous there. So we have a problem, and then that theorem doesn't exist. So we're going to look at this one a little bit more closely, especially at the first part of it. The limit as x approaches negative 1 of f of x. So as x approaches negative 1 from the right, and as x approaches negative 1 from the left, they're both approaching a value of 2 from below. In other words, this first limit that so we have the limit as x approaches 2 from below or from the left of our inner function f of x. So since the first inner limit was equal to 2, and we approach from the bottom, we can rewrite it like this and look as f of x approaches 2. Now just from the left-hand side, that limit is approaching 5. So the answer should have been 5 for that one. An example that was frequently missed was this one. We're trying to find the limit as x approaches 1 of f of x. And because we're just trying to find the limit and we're not checking continuity, this part doesn't matter at all, actually. What we're looking at is two-sided limit, the limit as x approaches 1 from the right, and the limit as x approaches 1 from the left. And as I look at this function, as x approaches 1 from the right, the absolute value doesn't matter at all. It's not doing anything unique. So we can just call it x minus 1. So here's what the function actually is. And if you simplify it, it simplifies down to this function. Plug 1 in for x. 1 minus 1 times 1 plus 1 gives us a value of 0. Now as x is approaching 1 from the left, then this absolute value, we're actually taking the opposite of that. And the x minus 1 up here is getting squared. And this x minus 1 squared becomes positive. Um, we're going to have this over at negative 1. Once we simplify and factor this thing, whole thing down and plug it in, we're going to get 1 minus 1 times 1 plus 1, which is 0, divided by negative 1 is still 0. So the limit from both sides is equal to zero, so our answer is letter A. This next problem was frequently missed as well because I think because people didn't evaluate it as the limit, instead they evaluated it as the function. So I just rewrote the problem and plugged in the limit as x approaches 3 of h of x, 2 times the limit of f of x, and 3 times the limit of g of x, all as x is approaching 3. Do the algebra and you'll get a value of 56. In this next one, we're supposed to find an error that the student made while doing this problem to see if the function is continuous at x equals 2. So if you look at the original function, you can factor it down, simplify down the x minus 2, and then this yellow function is equivalent to this simplified function everywhere except at x equals 2. So we can evaluate the limit as x approaches 2, plug it in, and we get negative 5 thirds. The problem here is in step number 3. The limit from the left and from the right as x approaches 2 is the same. The limit does exist. It's negative 5 thirds. But when x equals 2, we have to use the original function. That's where this yellow function and this blue function are different. They agree at all but one point, and that point is at x equals 2, which is a very significant one. So to find f of 2, we have to plug it in here. We get 0 over 0, which is indeterminate. It means there's a hole in the graph there. So this mistake here is in step number 3. This problem is pretty similar to one I did earlier, so I'd encourage you to pause the video, work through the problem, and see if you can evaluate the limit as x approaches negative 1 of f of f of x. In a moment, you can start it up again and listen to my explanation for this one. So the limit as x approaches negative 1 of f of f of x 
plug negative 1 in the limit as x approaches negative 1 of f of x. So we're approaching the value of negative 1. And the limit as x approaches negative 1 from both sides, that limit is 3. And it's 3 from below in both cases. So we can simplify this calling it the limit as x approaches 3 from below or from the left of f of x. So as x is approaching 3 from the left side and not the right side, we get the value of negative 1. Letter C is the correct answer. This next example, we're supposed to find the horizontal asymptotes of the graph of f. It's not asking for vertical asymptotes. It's looking for horizontal asymptotes. In other words, we're looking for n behavior as x goes towards infinity or negative infinity. So let's look at the limits as x goes towards infinity. And when you do that, the plus 1, the minus 1 is so insignificant, it doesn't matter. So we're really evaluating this limit right here. And if I were to look at it, then um, I could divide numerator and denominator by e to the x. So we have sine x over e to the negative 1, which would be sine x times e. Limit as x approaches infinity. And as x approaches infinity, e is just a number. And the sine is going to oscillate up and down, up and down. So this limit is not going to exist. There is no horizontal asymptote as we go to the right towards infinity. As x goes towards negative infinity of the same function, well, if we plug in a huge negative value, e to a negative, huge negative value is going to be 1 over e to a huge number. Small divided by huge. In other words, this comes out to 0. So it's 1 plus 0 in the numerator. The same problem in the denominator, e to a huge negative number. This makes this approach 0. 0 minus 1 is negative 1. So our limit is 1 over negative 1, which comes out simply to negative 1. Answer is y equals negative 1 only. In this next example, we're looking at the squeeze theorem. They're even telling us what the squeeze theorem says. So the question is, what is the limit as x approaches 0 of this? If we plug 0 in for x, we get an indeterminate value. So we're going to need to do a little bit of algebra on this one. And so I'm going to spread it out. This 8 that's in the denominator, I'm going to kick it up front, call it 1, 8. Cosine of 5x, this x this, that's attached to the 8x, I'm going to leave the x underneath that, at least for right now. And the cotangent is 1 over cosine of 2x over sine of 2x. Going further from the blue to the red, the 1, 8 stays on the outside. But I realized I don't need the x underneath this 5x. Because if I plug 0 in, cosine of 5 times 0 is a cosine of 0 and 1. There's no problem right there. Um, I want to get the sine of 2x out of the denominator. So times the sine of 2x times the sine of 2x, which is going to kick it up to the numerator. This cosine of 2x is staying down in that denominator. But here is where we really need the variable of x. Because if we plug 0 in for x everywhere right now, this comes out to 1. That's fine. This is 1 over 1. That's fine. But to use squeeze theorem, we need this value to be equal to 2x so that those angles match up with each other. But since I did not multiply the denominator by 2, I need to multiply the numerator by 2. And we'll just kick that out front because it's a constant. Now when we start actually fitting this limit, out front we have 2 eighths, which is 1 fourth. Plug 0 in, that's 1. Plug 0 in, here's our squeeze theorem, equal to 1. 1 over 2x, this is 1 over 1 then. When we plug 0 in for x, that's another 1. 1 fourth times all those gives us a final product of 1 fourth.